the lady rustic by alexander pushkin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard the lady rustic by alexander pushkin in one of our distant provinces was the estate of ivan petrovitch Barastov. as a youth he served in the guards but having left the army early in seventeen ninety seven he retired to his country seat and there remained he married a wife from among the poor nobility and when she died in childbed he happened to be detained on farming business in one of his distant fields his daily occupation soon brought him consolation he built a house on his own plan set up his own cloth factory became his own auditor and accountant and began to think himself the cleverest fellow in the whole district the neighbors who used to come to him upon a visit and bring their families and dogs took good care not to contradict him his workaday dress was a short coat of velveteen on holidays he wore a frock coat of cloth from his own factory his accounts took most of his time and he read nothing but the senatorial news on the whole though he was considered proud he was not disliked the only person who could never get on with him was his nearest neighbor grigory ivanovitch Maromsky, a true russian baron he had squandered in moscow a large part of his estate and having lost his wife as well as his money he had retired to his sole remaining property and there continued his extravagance but in a different way he set up an english garden on which he spent nearly all the income he had left his grooms were english liveries and english governess taught his daughter he farmed the land upon the english system but foreign farming grows no russian corn so in spite of his retirement the income of grigory ivanovitch did not increase even in the country he had a faculty for making new debts but he was no fool people said was he not the first landowner in all that province to mortgage his property to the government a process then generally believed to be one of great complexity and risk among his detractors Beristov, a thorough hater of innovation was the most severe in speaking of his neighbors anglomania he could scarcely keep his feelings under control and missed no opportunity for criticism to some compliment from a visitor to his estate he would answer with a knowing smile yes my farming is not like that of grigory ivanovitch i can't afford to ruin my land on the english system but i am satisfied to escape starvation on the russian obliging neighbors reported these and other jokes to grigory with additions and commentaries of their own the anglomaniac was as irritable as a journalist under this criticism and wrathfully referred to his critic as a bumpkin and a bear relations were thus strained when Beristov's son came home having finished his university career he wanted to go into the army but his father objected for the civil service young Beristov had no taste neither would yield so young alexis took up the life of a country gentleman and to be ready for emergencies cultivated a moustache he was really a handsome fellow and it would indeed have been a pity never to pinch his fine figure into a military uniform and instead of displaying his broad shoulders on horseback to round them over an office desk ever foremost in the hunting field and a straight rider it was quite clear declared the neighbors that he could never make a good official the shy young ladies glanced and the bold stared at him in admiration but he took no notice of them and each could only attribute his indifference to some prior attachment in fact there was in private circulation copied from an envelope in his handwriting this address a m p care of akulina petrovna Kirachkina, opposite alexiev monastery those readers who have not seen our country life can hardly realize the charm of these provincial girls breathing pure air under the shadow of their apple trees their only knowledge of the world is drawn from books in solitude and unrestrained 
their feelings and their passions develop early to a degree unknown to the busier beauties of our towns for them the tinkling of a bell is an event a drive into the nearest town an epoch and a chance visit a long sometimes an everlasting remembrance at their oddities he may laugh who will but superficial sneers cannot impair their real merits their individuality which so says jean paul is a necessary element of greatness the women in large towns may be better educated but the leveling influence of the world soon makes all women as much alike as their own headdresses let not this be regarded as condemnation still as an ancient writer says not a nostro mane it may be imagined what an impression alexis made on our country misses he was the first gloomy and disenchanted hero they had ever beheld the first who ever spoke to them of vanished joys and blighted past besides he wore a black ring with a death's head on it all this was quite a new thing in that province and the young ladies all went crazy but she in whose thoughts he dwelt most deeply was lisa or as the old anglomaniac called her betty the daughter of grigory ivanovitch their fathers did not visit so she had never seen alexis who was the sole topic of conversation among her young neighbors she was just seventeen with dark eyes lighting up her pretty face an only and consequently a spoilt child full of life and mischief she was the delight of her father and the distraction of her governess miss jackson a prim spinster in the forties who powdered her face and blackened her eyebrows read pamela twice a year drew a salary of two thousand roubles and was nearly bored to death in barbarous russia lisa's maid nastia was older but quite as flighty as her mistress who was very fond of her and had her as confident in all her secrets and as fellow-conspirator in her mischief in fact no leading lady played half such an important part in french tragedy as was played by nastia in the village said nastia while dressing her young lady may i go to-day and visit a friend yes where to the barostoffs it is the cook's names day he called yesterday to ask us to dinner then said lisa the master's quarrel and the servants entertain one another and what does that matter to us said nastia i belong to you and not to your father you have not quarrelled with young Verostov yet let the old people fight if they please nastia try and see alexey Verostov. come back and tell me all about him nastia promised lisa spent the whole day impatiently waiting for her in the evening she returned well lizabetha grigory Evna, she said as she entered the room i have seen young Verostov. i had a good look at him we spent the whole day together how so tell me about it certainly we started i and anisa yes yes i know what then i would rather tell you in proper order we were just in time for the room was quite full there were the zaharyevskys the steward's wife and daughters the shlopenskys yes yes and Barostov. wait a bit we sat down to dinner the steward's wife had the seat of honour i sat next to her and her daughters were huffy but what do i care oh nastya how tiresome you are with these everlasting details how impatient you are well then we rose from table we had been sitting for about three hours and it was a splendid dinner party blue red and striped creams then we went into the garden to play a kiss in the ring when the young gentleman appeared well is it true is he so handsome wonderfully handsome i may say beautiful tall stately with a lovely colour really i thought his face was pale well how did he strike you was he melancholy and thoughtful oh no i never saw such a mad fellow he took it into his head to join us at kiss in the ring he played at kiss in the ring it is impossible no it's very possible and what more do you think 
when he caught any one he kissed her of course you may tell lie if you like nasty as you please miss only i am not lying i could scarcely get away from him indeed he spent the whole day with us why do people say then that he is in love and looks at nobody i am sure i don't know miss he looked too much at me and tanya too the steward's daughter and at pasha too in fact he neglected nobody he is such a wild fellow this is surprising and what do the servants say about him they say he is a splendid gentleman so kind so lively he has only one fault he is too fond of the girls but i don't think that is such a great fault he will get steadier in time how i should like to see him said lisa with a sigh and why can't you tagalovo is only a mile off take a walk in that direction or a ride and you are sure to meet him he shoulders his gun and goes shooting every morning no it would never do he would think i was running after him besides our fathers have quarrelled so he and i could hardly set up a friendship oh nastia i know what i'll do i will dress up like a peasant that will do put on a coarse chemise and a seraphon and set out boldly for tagalovo Barostov will never miss you i promise you i can talk like a peasant splendidly oh nastia dear nastia what a happy thought and lisa went to bed resolved to carry out her plan next day she made her preparations she went to the market for some coarse linen some dark blue stuff and some brass buttons and out of these nastia and she cut a chemise and a seraphim all the maid-servants were set down to sew and by evening everything was ready as she tried on her new costume before the glass lisa said to herself that she had never looked so nice then she began to rehearse her meeting with alexis first she gave him a low bow as she passed along then she continued to nod her head like a mandarin next she addressed him in a peasant patois simpering and shyly hiding her face behind her sleeve nasty gave the performance her full approval but there was one difficulty she tried to cross the yard barefooted but the grass stalks pricked her tender feet and the gravel caused intolerable pain nastik again came to the rescue she took the measure of lisa's foot and hurried across the fields to the herdsman trophim of whom she ordered a pair of bark shoes the next morning before daylight lisa awoke the whole household was still asleep nastia was at the gate waiting for the herdsman soon the sound of his horn drew near and the village herd straggled past the manor gates after them came trophim who as he passed handed to nastia a little pair of speckled bark shoes and received a rouble lisa who had quietly donned her peasant dress whispered to nastia her last instructions about miss jackson then she went through the kitchen out of the back door into the open field then she began to run dawn was breaking and the rows of golden clouds stood like courtiers waiting for their monarch the clear sky the fresh morning air the dew the breeze and singing of the birds filled lisa's heart with childlike joy fearing to meet with some acquaintance she did not walk but flew as she drew near the wood where lay the boundary of her father's property she slackened the pace it was here she was to meet alexis her heart beat violently she knew not why the terrors of our youthful escapades are their chief charm lisa stepped forward into the darkness of the wood its hollow echoes bade her welcome her buoyant spirits gradually gave place to meditation she thought but who shall truly tell the thoughts of sweet seventeen in a wood alone at six o'clock on a spring morning and as she walked in meditation under the shade of lofty trees suddenly a beautiful pointer began to bark at her lisa cried out with fear and at the same moment a voice exclaimed to bo sugar isi and a young sportsman stepped from behind the bushes don't be afraid my dear he won't bite lisa had already recovered from her fright and instantly took advantage of the situation it's all very well sir she said 
with an assumed timidity and shyness i am afraid of him he seems such a savage creature and may fly at me again alexis whom the reader has already recognized looked steadily at the young peasant i will escort you if you are afraid will you allow me to walk by your side who is to prevent you replied lisa a freeman can do as he likes and the road is public where do you come from from Pilachina. i am the daughter of yasiri the blacksmith and i am looking for mushrooms she was carrying a basket suspended from her shoulders by a cord and you baron are you from tugalovo exactly i am the young gentleman's valet he wished to equalize their ranks but lisa looked at him and laughed ah you are lying she said i am not a fool i see you are the master himself what makes you think so everything still how can one help it you are not dressed like a servant you speak differently you even call your dog in a foreign tongue lisa charmed him more and more every moment accustomed to be unceremonious with pretty country girls he tried to kiss her but lisa jumped aside and suddenly assumed so distant and severe an air that though it amused him he did not attempt any further familiarities if you wish to remain friends she said with dignity do not forget yourself who has taught you this wisdom asked alexis with a laugh can it be my little friend nastia your mistress's maid so this is how civilization spreads lisa felt she had almost betrayed herself and said do you think i have never been up to the manor house i have seen and heard more than you think still chattering here with you won't get me mushrooms you go that way baron i'll go the other begging your pardon and lisa made as if to depart but alexis held her by the hand what is your name my dear aculina she said struggling to get her fingers free let me go baron it is time for me to be home well my friend aculina i shall certainly call on your father yasili the blacksmith for the lord's sake don't do that if they knew at home i had been talking here alone with the young baron i should catch it my father would beat me within an inch of my life well i must see you again i will come again some other day for mushrooms when to-morrow if you like my dear aquilina i would kiss you if i dared to-morrow then at the same time that is a bargain all right you will not play me false no swear it by the holy friday then i will come the young couple parted lisa ran out of the wood across the fields stole into the garden and rushed headlong into the farmyard where nastya was waiting for her then she changed her dress answering at random the impatient questions of her confidant and went into the dining-room to find the cloth laid and breakfast ready miss jackson freshly powdered and laced until she looked like a wine-glass was cutting thin slices of bread and butter her father complimented lisa on her early walk there is no healthier habit he remarked than to rise at daybreak he quoted from the english papers several cases of longevity adding that all centenarians had abstained from spirits and made it a practice to rise at daybreak winter and summer lisa did not prove an attentive listener she was repeating in her mind the details of her morning's interview and as she recalled aquilina's conversation with the young sportsman her conscience smote her in vain she assured herself that the bounds of decorum had not been passed this joke she argued could could have no evil consequences but conscience would not be quieted what most disturbed her was her promise to repeat the meeting she half decided not to keep her word but then alexis tired of waiting might go to seek the blacksmith's daughter in the village and find the real aquilina a stout pockmarked girl and so discover the hoax alarmed at this she determined to reenact the part of aquilina alexis was enchanted all day he thought about his new acquaintance and at night he dreamt of her it was scarcely dawn when he was up and dressed without waiting even to load his gun he set out followed by the faithful shogun 
and ran to the meeting-place half an hour passed in undeniable delay at last he caught a glimpse of a blue seraphine among the bushes and rushed to meet dear aquilina she smiled to see his eagerness but he saw traces of anxiety and melancholy on her face he asked her the cause and she at last confessed she had been flighty and was very sorry for it she had meant not to keep her promise and this meeting at any rate must be the last she begged him not to seek to continue an acquaintance which could have no good end all this of course was said in a peasant dialect but the thought and feeling struck alexis as unusual in a peasant in eloquent words he urged her to abandon this cruel resolution she should have no reason for repentance he would obey her in everything if only she would not rob him of his one happiness and let him see her alone three times or even only twice a week he spoke with passion and at the moment he was really in love lisa listened to him in silence promise she said to seek no other meetings with me but those which i myself appoint he was about to swear by the holy friday when she stopped him with a smile i do not want you to swear your work is enough then together they wandered talking in the wood till lisa said it is time they parted and alexis was left to wonder how in two meetings a simple rustic had gained such influence over him there was a freshness and novelty about it all that charmed him and though the conditions she imposed were irksome the thought of breaking his promise never even entered his mind after all in spite of his fatal ring and the mysterious correspondence alexis was a kind and affectionate youth with a pure heart still capable of innocent enjoyment did i consult only my own wishes i should dwell at length on the meetings of these young people their growing love their mutual trust and all they said but my pleasure i know would not be shared by the majority of my readers so for their sake i will omit them i will only say that in a brief two months alexis was already madly in love and lisa though more reticent than he was not indifferent happy in the present they took little thought for the future visions of indissoluble ties flitted not seldom through the minds of both but neither mentioned them for alexis however strong his attachment to aquilina could not forget the social distance that was between them while lisa knowing the enmity between their fathers dared not count on their becoming reconciled besides her vanity was stimulated by the vague romantic hope of at least seeing the lord of tugalovo at the feet of the daughter of a village blacksmith suddenly something happened which came near to change the course of their true love one of those cold bright mornings so common in our russian autumns ivan berestov came a-riding for all emergencies he brought with him six pointers and a dozen beaters that same morning grigory moromsky tempted by the fine weather saddled his english mare and came trotting through his agricultural estates nearing the wood he came upon his neighbor proudly seated in the saddle wearing his fur-lined overcoat ivan berestov was waiting for the hare which the beaters were driving with discordant noises out of the brushwood if moromsky could have foreseen this meeting he would have avoided it but finding himself suddenly within pistol shot there was no escape like a cultivated european gentleman moromsky rode up to and addressed his enemy politely berestov answered with the grace of a chained bear dancing to the order of his keeper at this moment out shot the hare and scudded across the field berestov and his groom shouted to loose the dogs and started after them full speed moronsky's mare took fright and bolted her rider who often boasted of his horsemanship gave her her head and chuckled inwardly over this opportunity of escaping a disagreeable companion but the mare coming at a gallop 
to an unseen ditch swerved moronsky lost his seat fell rather heavily on the frozen ground and lay there cursing the animal which sobered by the loss of her master stopped at once Barastoff galloped to the rescue asking if moronsky was hurt meanwhile the groom led up the culprit by the bridle Barastoff helped moronsky into the saddle and then invited him to his house peeling himself under an obligation moronsky could not refuse and so Barastoff returned in glory having killed the hare and bringing home with him his adversary wounded and almost a prisoner of war at breakfast the neighbors fell into rather friendly conversation moronsky asked Barastoff to lend him a droshky confessing that his fall made it too painful for him to ride back Barastoff accompanied him to the outer gate and before the leave-taking was over moronsky had obtained from him a promise to come and bring alexis to a friendly dinner at perlochina next day so this old enmity which seemed before so deeply rooted was on the point of ending because the little mare had taken fright lisa ran to meet her father on his return what has happened papa she asked in astonishment why are you limping where is the mare whose droshky is this my dear you will never guess and then he told her lisa could not believe her ears before she had time to collect herself she heard that to-morrow both the Barastoffs would come to dinner what do you say she exclaimed turning pale the Barastoffs, father and son dine with us to-morrow no papa you can do as you please i certainly do not appear why are you mad since when have you become so shy have you imbibed hereditary hatred like a heroine of romance come don't be afoot no papa nothing on earth shall induce me to meet the Barastoffs. her father shrugged his shoulders and left off arguing he knew he could not prevail with her by opposition so he went to bed after his memorable ride lisa too went to her room and summoned nastya long did they discuss the coming visit what will alexis think on recognizing in the cultivated young lady his aculina what opinion will he form as to her behavior and her sense on the other hand lisa was very curious to see how such an unexpected meeting would affect him then an idea struck her she told it to nastya and with rejoicing they determined to carry it into effect next morning at breakfast moronsky asked his daughter whether she still meant to hide from the Barastoffs. papa she answered i will receive them if you wish it on one condition however i may appear before them whatever i may do you must promise me not to be angry and you must show no surprise or disapproval at your tricks again exclaimed moronsky laughing well well i consent do as you please my black-eyed mischief with these words he kissed her forehead and lisa ran off to make her preparations punctually at two six horses drawing the home-made carriage drove into the courtyard and skirted the circle of green turf that formed its centre old Barastoff, helped by two of moronsky's servants in livery mounted the steps his son followed immediately on horseback and the two together entered the dining-room where the table was already laid moromsky gave his guests a cordial welcome and proposing a tour of inspection of the garden and livestock before dinner led them along his well-swept gravel paths old Barastoff secretly deplored the time and trouble wasted on such a useless whim as this anglomania but politeness forbade him to express his feelings his son shared neither the disapproval of the careful farmer nor the enthusiasm of the complacent anglomaniac he impatiently awaited the appearance of his host's daughter of whom he had often heard for though his heart as we know was no longer free a young and unknown beauty might still claim his interest when they had come back and were all seated in the drawing-room the old man talked over bygone days retelling the stories of the mess-room 
while alexis considered what attitude he should assume towards lisa he decided upon a cold preoccupation as most suitable and arranged accordingly the door opened he turned his head round with indifference with such proud indifference that the heart of the most hardened coquette must have quivered unfortunately there came in not lisa but elderly miss jackson whitened laced in with downcast eyes in her little curtsy and alexis's magnificent military movement failed before he could reassemble his scattered forces the door opened again and this time entered lisa all rose moronsky began the introductions but suddenly stopped and bit his lip lisa his dark lisa was painted white up to her ears and penciled worse than miss jackson herself she wore false fair ringlets puffed out like a louis the fourteenth wig her sleeves a la imbecile extended like the hoops of madame de pompadour her figure was laced in like a letter x and all those of her mother's diamonds which had escaped the pawnbroker sparkled on her fingers neck and ears alexis could not discover in this ridiculous young lady his aquilina his father kissed her hand and he much to his annoyance had to do the same as he touched her little white fingers they seemed to tremble he noticed too a tiny foot intentionally displayed and shod in the most coquettish of shoes this reconciled him a little to the rest of her attire the white paint and black penciling to tell the truth in his simplicity he did not notice at first nor indeed afterwards grigory Maronsky, remembering his promise tried not to show surprise for the rest he was so much amused at his daughter's mischief that he could scarcely keep his countenance for the prim englishwoman however it was no laughing matter she guessed that the white and black paint had been abstracted from her drawer and a red patch of indignation shone through the artificial whiteness of her face flaming glances shot from her eyes at the young rogue who reserving all explanation for the future pretended not to notice them they sat down to table alexis continuing his performance as an absent-minded pensive man lisa was all affectation she minced her words drawled and would speak only in french her father glanced at her from time to time unable to divine her object but he thought it all a great joke the englishwoman fumed but said nothing ivan berestov alone felt at his ease he ate for two drank his fill and as the meal went on became more and more friendly and laughed louder and louder at last they rose from the table the guests departed and moromsky gave vent to his mirth and curiosity what made you play such tricks upon them he inquired do you know lisa that white paint really becomes you i do not wish to pry into the secrets of a lady's toilet but if i were you i should always paint not too much of course but a little lisa was delighted with her success she kissed her father promised to consider his suggestion and ran off to propitiate the enraged miss jackson whom she could scarcely prevail upon to open the door and hear her excuses lisa was ashamed she said to show herself before the visitors such a blackamoor she had not dared to ask she knew dear kind miss jackson would forgive her miss jackson persuaded that her pupil had not meant to ridicule her became pacified kissed lisa and in token of forgiveness presented her with a little pot of english white which the latter with expressions of deep gratitude accepted next morning as the reader will have guessed lisa hastened to the meeting in the wood you were yesterday at our master's sir she began to alexis what did you think of our young lady alexis answered that he had not observed her that is a pity why because i wanted to ask you if what they say is true what do they say that i resemble our young lady do you think so what nonsense she is a deformity beside you oh baron it is a sin of you to say so our young lady is so fair so elegant 
how can i vie with her alexis vowed that she was prettier than all imaginable fair young ladies and to appease her thoroughly began describing her young lady so funnily that lisa burst into a hearty laugh still she said with a sigh though she may be ridiculous yet by her side i am an illiterate fool well that is a thing to worry yourself about if you like i will teach you to read at once are you in earnest shall i really try if you like my darling we will begin at once they sat down alexis produced a pencil and notebook and aquilina proved astonishingly quick in learning the alphabet alexis wondered at her intelligence at their next meeting she wished to learn to write the pencil at first would not obey her but in a few minutes she could trace the letters pretty well how wonderfully we get on faster than by the lancaster method indeed at the third lesson aquilina could read words of even three syllables and the intelligent remarks with which she interrupted the lessons fairly astonished alexis as for writing she covered a whole page with aphorisms taken from the story she had been reading a week passed and they had begun a correspondence their post office was the trunk of an old oak and nastia secretly played the part of postman thither alexis would bring his letters written in a large round hand and there he found the letters of his beloved scrawled on coarse blue paper aquilina's style was evidently improving and her mind clearly was developing under cultivation meanwhile the new-made acquaintance between berestov and Moromsky grew stronger soon it became friendship Moromsky often reflected that on the death of old berestov his property would come to alexis who would then be one of the richest landowners in that province why should he not marry lisa old berestov on the other hand though he looked on his neighbor as a lunatic did not deny that he possessed many excellent qualities among them a certain cleverness Moromsky was related to count pronsky a distinguished and influential man the count might be very useful to alexis and Moromsky, so thought berestov would probably be glad to marry his daughter so well both the old men pondered all this so thoroughly that at last they broached the subject confabulated embraced and severally began a plan of campaign Moromsky foresaw one difficulty how to persuade his betty to make the better acquaintance of alexis whom she had never seen since the memorable dinner they hardly seemed to suit each other well at any rate alexis had not renewed his visit to Pelicina. whenever old berestov called lisa made a point of retreating to her own room but thought Moromsky, if alexis called every day betty could not help falling in love with him that is the way to manage it time will settle everything Berestov troubled himself less about his plans. That same evening he called his son into his study, lit his pipe, and, after a short silence, began. You have not spoken about the army lately, Alexis. Has the hussar uniform lost its attraction for you? No, father, he replied respectfully. I know you do not wish me to join the hussars. It is my duty to consult your wishes i am pleased to find you such an obedient son still i do not wish to force your inclinations i will not insist upon your entering the civil service at once and in the meantime i mean to marry you to whom father exclaimed his astonished son to lisa Moromskaya. she is good enough for anyone isn't she father i did not think of marrying just yet perhaps not but i have thought about it for you as you please but i don't care about lisa Muromskaya at all you will care about her afterwards you will get used to her and you will learn to love her i feel i could not make her happy you need not trouble yourself about that all you have to do is to respect the wishes of your father i do not wish to marry and i won't you shall marry or i will curse you 
and by heaven i will sell and squander my property and not leave you a farthing i will give you three days for reflection and in the meanwhile do not dare to show your face in my presence alexis knew that when his father took a thing into his head nothing could knock it out again but then alexis was as obstinate as his father he went to his room and there reflected upon the limits of parental authority on lisa moromskaya his father's threat to make him a beggar and finally he thought of aculina for the first time he clearly saw how much he loved her the romantic idea of marrying a peasant girl and working for a living came into his mind and the more he thought of it the more he approved it their meetings in the wood had been stopped of late by the wet weather he wrote to aculena in the roundest hand and the maddest style telling her of his impending ruin and asking her to be his wife he took the letter at once to the tree trunk dropped it in and went much satisfied with himself to bed next morning firm in resolution he started early to call on moronsky and explain the situation he meant to win him over by appealing to his generosity is mr moronsky at home he asked reining up his horse at the porch no sir mr moronsky went out early this morning how provoking thought alexis well is miss lisa at home yes sir and throwing the reins to the footman alexis leapt from his horse and entered unannounced it will soon be over he thought going towards the drawing-room i will explain to miss moromsky herself he entered and was transfixed lisa no aculina dear dark aculina wearing no seraphim but a white morning frock sat by the window reading his letter so intent was she upon it that she did not hear him enter alexis could not repress a cry of delight lisa started raised her hand cried out and attempted to run away he rushed to stop her aculina aculina lisa tried to free herself mais laissez moi donc monsieur mais êtes-vous fou she repeated turning away aculina my darling aculina he repeated kissing her hand miss jackson who was an eye-witness of this scene knew not what to think the door opened and grigory moronsky entered ah cried he you seem to have settled things between you the reader will excuse me the unnecessary trouble of winding up End of the rustic lady by alexander pushkin the saint and the goblin from reginald in russia and other sketches by sakai this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman The Saint and the Goblin by Sakai The little stone saint occupied a retired niche in a side aisle of the old cathedral. No one quite remembered who he had been, but that, in a way, was a guarantee of respectability. At least, so the goblin said. The goblin was a very fine specimen of quaint stone carving, and lived up in a corbel, on the wall opposite the niche of the little saint. He was connected with some of the best cathedral folk, such as the queer carvings in the choir stalls and chancel ring, and even the gargoyles high up on the roof. All the fantastic beasts and mannequins that sprawled and twisted in wood or stone or lead overhead in the archways, or way down in the crypts, were in some way kin to him. Consequently, he was a person of recognized importance in the cathedral world, the little stone saint and the goblin got along very well together, though they looked at most things from different points of view. The saint was a philanthropist in the old-fashioned way. He thought the world, as he saw it, was good, but might be improved. In particular, he pitied the church mice, who were miserably poor. The goblin, on the other hand, was of the opinion that the world, as he knew it, was bad, but had better be let alone. 
it was a function of the church mice to be poor all the same said the saint i feel very sorry for them of course you do said the goblin it's your function to feel sorry for them if they were to leave off being poor you couldn't fulfill your functions you'd be a sinecure he rather hoped that the saint would ask him what a sinecure meant but the latter took refuge in a stony silence the goblin might be right but still he thought he would like to do something for the church mice before wither came on they were so very poor whilst he was thinking the matter over he was startled by something falling between his feet with a hard metallic clatter it was a bright new thaler one of the cathedral jackdaws who collected such things had flown with it to a stone cornice just above his niche and the banging of the sacristy door had startled him into dropping it since the invention of gunpowder the family nerves were not what they had been what have you got there asked the goblin a silver thaler said the saint really he continued it is most fortunate now i can do something for the church mice how will you manage it asked the goblin the saint considered i will appear in a vision to the vergeress who sweeps the floors i will tell her that she will find a silver thaler between my feet and that she must take it and buy a measure of corn and put it on my shrine when she finds the money she will know that it is a true dream and she will take care to follow my instructions then the mice will have food all winter of course you can do that observed the goblin now i can only appear to people after they have had a heavy supper of indigestible things my opportunities with the vergeress would be limited there is some advantage in being a saint after all all this while the coin was lying at the saint's feet it was clean and glittering and had the elector's arms beautifully stamped upon it the saint began to reflect that such an opportunity was too rare to be hastily disposed of perhaps indiscriminate charity might be harmful to the church mice after all it was their function to be poor and the goblin had said so and the goblin was generally right i have been thinking he said to that personage that perhaps it would be really better if i ordered a thaler's worth of candles to be placed on my shrine instead of the corn he often wished for the look of the thing that people would sometimes burn candles at his shrine but as they had forgotten who he was it was not considered a profitable speculation to pay him that attention candles would be more orthodox said the goblin more orthodox certainly agreed the saint and the mice could have the ends to eat candle ends are most fat the goblin was too well bred to wink besides being a stone goblin it was out of the question well if it ain't there sure enough said the vergeress next morning she took the shiny coin down from the dusty niche and turned it over and over in her grimy hands then she put it in her mouth and bit it she can't be going to eat it thought the saint and fixed her with his stoniest stare well said the woman in a somewhat shriller key who'd a thought it a saint too then she did an unaccountable thing she hunted an old piece of tape out of her pocket and tied it to crosswise with a big loop round the thaler and hung it round the neck of the little saint then she went away the only possible explanation said the goblin is that it's a bad one what is that decoration your neighbor is wearing asked the wyvern who was wrought into the capital of an adjacent pillar the saint was ready to cry with mortification only being of stone he couldn't it's a coin of <clears throat> fabulous value replied the goblin tactfully the news went around the cathedral that the shrine of the little stone saint had been enriched by a priceless offering after all it's something to have the conscience of a goblin said the saint to himself the church mice were as poor as ever but that was their function End of The Saint and the Goblin by Sakai The Parable of the Three Kings from Nathan the Wise by Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, 1729 to 1781. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Nathan In the oldest times, and in an eastern land, there lived a man who had a precious ring. This gem, an opal of a hundred tints, had such a virtue as would make the wearer who trusted it beloved by God and man. What wonder if the man who had this ring preserved it well, and by his will declared it should for ever in his house remain. At last, when death came near, he called the son whom he loved best, and gave to him the ring, with one strict charge. My son, when you must die, let this be given to your own darling child, the son whom you love best, without regard to any rights of birth. T'was thus the ring was always passed on to the best beloved. Sultan, you understand me? Saladin, yea, go on. Nathan, a father who at last possessed this ring had three dear sons, all dutiful and true, all three alike beloved. But at one time this son and then another seemed most dear, most worthy of the ring and it was given by promise first to this son then to that until it might be claimed by all the three at last when death drew nigh the father felt his heart distracted by the doubt to whom the ring was due he could not favour one and leave two sons in grief how did he act he called a goldsmith in gave him the gem and bade him make exactly of that form two other rings and spare nor cost nor pains to make all three alike and this was done so well the owner of the first true ring could find no shade of difference in the three and now he called his sons one at a time he gave to each a blessing and a ring one of the three and died Saladin. Well well go on nathan my tale is ended you may guess the sequel the father dies immediately each son comes forward with his ring and asks to be proclaimed as head and ruler of the house all three assert one claim and show their rings all made alike to find the first the true it was as great a puzzle as for us to find the one true faith saladin is that then all the answer i must have nathan tis my apology if i decline to act as judge or to select the ring the one true gem of three all made alike all given by one saladin there talk no more of rings the three religions that at first were named are all distinct i down to dress food drink nathan just so and yet their claims are all alike as founded upon history on facts believed and handed down from sire to son uniting them in faith can we the jews distrust the testimony of our race distrust the men who gave us birth whose love did ne'er deceive us but when we were babes taught us by means of fables for our good must you distrust your own true ancestors to flatter mine or must a christian doubt his father's words and so agree with ours saladin allah the israelite is speaking truth and i am silenced nathan let me name the rings once more the sons at last in bitter strife appeared before a judge and each declared he had the one true gem given by his father all said the same and all three spoke the truth each rather than suspect his father's word accused his brethren of a fraud saladin what then what sentence could the judge pronounce go on nathan thus said the judge go bring your father here let him come forth or i dismiss the case must i sit guessing riddles must i wait till the true ring shall speak out for itself 
but stay twas said that the authentic gem had virtue that could make its wearer loved by god and man that shall decide the case tell me who of the three is best beloved by his two brethren silent then the ring has lost its charm each claimant loves himself but wins no love the rings are forgeries tis plain the first authentic gem was lost but keep this word with you and hide his loss your father had these three rings made these three instead of one saladin well spoken judge at last nathan but stay the judge continued hear one word the best advice i have to give then go let each still trust the ring given by his father it might be he would show no partial love he loved all three and therefore would not give the ring to one and grieve the other too go emulate your father's equal love let each first test his ring and show its power but aid it while you test be merciful forbearing kind to all men and submit your will to god such virtues shall increase whatever powers the rings themselves may have when these among your late posterity have shown their virtue in some future time a thousand thousand years away from now then hither come again a wiser man than one now sitting here will hear you then and will pronounce the sentence saladin allah allah nathan now saladin art thou that wiser man art thou the judge who will at last pronounce this sentence saladin grasps nathan's hand and holds to the end of the conversation saladin i the judge i'm dust i'm nothing tis allah nathan now i understand the thousand thousand years have not yet passed the judge is not yet come i must not place myself upon his throne i understand farewell dear nathan go be still my friend end of the parable of the three kings from nathan the wise by Gothold Ephraim Lessing, 1729 to 1781. The Two Pedestrians by Carolyn Wells. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. THE TWO PEDESTRIANS by Carolyn Wells Once upon a time there were two men, one of whom was a good man, and the other a rogue. The good man one day saw a wretched drunkard endeavoring to find his way home. Being most kind-hearted, the good man assisted the wretched drunkard to his feet, and accompanied him along the highway toward his home. The good man held fast to the arm of the wretched drunkard, and the result was that when the wretched drunkard lurched giddily, the good man perforce lurched too. Whereupon, as the passing populace saw the pair, they said, Ah, another good man gone wrong, and they wisely wagged their heads. Now the bad man of this tale, being withal of a shrewd and candy nature, stood often on a street corner and engaged in grave conversations with the magnates of the town to be sure the magnates shook him as soon as possible but in no wise discouraged he cheerfully sauntered up to another magnet thus did he gain a reputation of being a friend of the great morals this fable teaches us that a man is known by the company he keeps and that we must not judge by appearances the end of the Two Pedestrians by Carolyn Wells Why the Sea is Salt From Popular Tales from the Norse By Sir George Webb de Sant 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Why the Sea is Salt by Sir George Webb de Sant. Once upon a time, but it was a long, long time ago, there were two brothers, one rich and one poor. Now one Christmas Eve the poor one hadn't so much as a crumb in the house, neither meat nor bread. So he went to his brother and asked him for something to keep Christmas with, in God's name. It was not the first time his brother had been forced to help him, and you may fancy he wasn't very glad to see his face. But he said, If you will do what I ask you to do, I'll give you a whole flitch of bacon. So the poor brother said he would do anything, and was full of thanks. Well, here is the flitch, said the rich brother. Now go straight to hell. What I have given my word to do, I must stick to, said the other. So he took the flitch and set off. He walked the whole day, and at dusk he came to a place where he saw a very bright light. Maybe this is the place, said the man to himself. So he turned aside, and the first thing he saw was an old, old man with a long white beard who stood in an outhouse, hewing wood for the Christmas fire. "'Good evening,' said the man with the filch. "'Same to you. Whither are you going so late?' said the man. "'Oh, I'm going to hell, if only I knew the right way,' answered the poor man. "'Well, you're not far wrong, for this is hell,' said the old man. "'When you get inside, they will be all for buying your flitch, for meat is scarce in hell.' But mind, you don't sell it unless you get a hand quern that stands behind the door for it. When you come out, I'll teach you how to handle the quern, for it's good to grind almost anything. So the man with the flitch thanked the other for his good advice, and gave a great knock at the devil's door. When he got in, everything was just as the old man had said. All the devils, great and small, came swarming up to him like ants round an anthill and each tried to outbid the other for the flitch. "'Well,' said the man, "'by rights my old dame and I ought to have this flitch for our Christmas dinner. But since you have all set your hearts on it, I suppose I must give it up to you. But if I sell it at all, I have to get the quern behind the door yonder.' At first the devil wouldn't hear of such a bargain, and chafed and haggled with the man. But he stuck to what he said, and at last the devil had to part with his quern. When the man got into the yard, he asked the old woodcutter how he was to handle the quern, and after he had learned how to use it, he thanked the old man and went off home as fast as he could. But still the clock had struck twelve on Christmas Eve before he reached his own door. "'Wherever in the world have you been?' said his old dame. "'Here have I sat hour after hour waiting and watching, without so much as two sticks to lay together under the Christmas brose. "'Oh,' said the man, "'I couldn't get back before, for I had to go a long way first, for one thing, and then for another. "'And now you shall see what you shall see.' "'So he put the quern on the table, and bade it first of all grind lights, "'then a tablecloth, then meat, then ale, and so on, "'until he had got everything that was nice for Christmas fare. "'He had only to speak the word, and the quern ground out what he wanted. "'The old dame stood by, blessing her stars.' and kept on asking where he had got the wonderful quern, but he wouldn't tell her. "'It's all one where I got it from. You see the quern is a good one, and the mill stream never freezes. That's enough.' So he ground meat and drink and dainties enough to last till twelfth day, and on the third day he asked all his friends and kin to his house, and gave a great feast. Now when his rich brother saw all that was on the table, and all that was behind in the larder, he grew quite spiteful and wild, for he couldn't bear that his brother should have anything. "'Twas only on Christmas Eve,' he said to the rest. He was in such straits that he came and asked for a morsel of food in God's name, and now he gives a feast as if he were a count or a king. And he turned to his brother and said, "'But whence in hell's name have you got all this wealth?' "'From behind the door,' answered the owner of the quern but he didn't care to let the cat out of the bag. But later on that evening, when he had got a drop too much, he could keep his secret no longer, and brought out the quern and said, 
There, you see what has gotten me all this well. And so he made the quern grind out all sorts of things. When the brother saw it, he set his heart on having the quern, and after a deal of coaxing he got it. But he had to pay three hundred dollars for it, and his brother bargained to keep it until hay harvest, for he thought, if I can keep it till then, I can make it grind meat and drink that will last for years. So you may fancy that the quern didn't grow rusty from want of work. And when the hay harvest came, the rich brother got it, but the other took care not to teach him how to handle it. It was evening when the rich brother got the quern home, and the next morning he told his wife to go out into the hay fields and toss, while the mowers cut the grass, and he would stay at home and get the dinner ready. So when dinner time drew near, he put the quern on the table and said, Grind herrings and broth, and grind them good and fast. So the quern began to grind herrings and broth. First of all, all the dishes full, then all the tubs full, and so on, until the kitchen floor was quite covered. Then the man twisted and twirled at the quern to get it to stop, but for all his twisting and fingering the quern went on grinding, and in a little while the broth rose so high that the man was like to drown, so he threw open the kitchen door and ran into the parlor. But it wasn't long before the quern had ground the parlor full too, and it was only at the risk of his life that the man could get hold of the latch of the house door through the stream of broth. When he got the door open, he ran out and set off down the road, with the stream of herrings and broth at his heels, roaring like a waterfall over the whole farm. Now, his old dame, who was in the field tossing hay, thought it was a long time to dinner, and at last she said, Well, though the master doesn't call us home, we may as well go. Maybe he finds it hard work to boil the broth, and will be glad of my help. The men were willing enough, so they sauntered homewards, but just as they got a little way up the hill, what should they meet but herrings, and broth, and bread, all running and dashing and splashing together in a stream, and the master himself running before them for his life. And as he passed them he bawled out, Would to heaven that each of you had a hundred throats, but take care you're not drowned in the broth. Away he went, as though the evil one were at his heels to his brother's house, and begged him, for God's sake, to take back the quern that instant. For he said, If it grinds only one hour more, the whole parish will be swallowed up by herrings and broth. But his brother wouldn't think of taking it back until the other had paid him down three hundred dollars more. So the poor brother got both the money and the quern, and it wasn't long before he set up a farmhouse, far finer than the one in which his brother lived and with the quern he ground so much gold that he covered it with plates of gold. And as the farm lay by the seaside, the golden house gleamed and glistened far away over the sea. All who sailed by put ashore to see the rich man in the golden house, and to see the wonderful quern, the fame of which spread far and wide, until there was nobody who hadn't heard tell of it. So one day there was a skipper who wanted to see the quern, and the first thing he asked was if it could grind salt. Grind salt, said the owner. I should think it could. It can grind anything. When the skipper heard that, he said he must have the quern, cost what it would, for if he only had it, he thought he should be rid of his long voyages across the stormy seas for a lading of salt. Well, at first the man wouldn't hear of parting with the quern, but the skipper begged and prayed so hard that at last he let him have it but he had to pay many, many thousand dollars for it. Now when the skipper had got the quern on his back, he soon made off with it, for he was afraid lest the man should change his mind. So he had no time to ask how to handle the quern, but got on board his ship as fast as he could, and set sail. When he had sailed a good way off, he brought the quern on deck and said, Grind salt, and grind both good and fast. Well, the quern began to grind salt, so that it poured out like water, and when the skipper had got the ship full, he wished to stop the quern. But whichever way he turned it, and however much he tried, it was no good. The quern kept grinding on, and the heap of salt grew higher and higher, and at last down sank the boat. There lies a quern at the bottom of the sea, and it grinds away at this very day, and that's why the sea is salt. End of 
why the sea is salt by sir george webb de Sun. 